What concerns you? It might weigh you down, or it may be the thing you deeply love. It's usually the thing you think about the most. So what is it? What concerns you? There's one man in the Bible, a fisherman named Peter, whose concerns collided with Jesus out on a lake. So I don't know anything about fishing. I can barely catch a fish at my local park with a hook and a worm, much less make a living, support my family, keep a roof over our head. But that's who Peter was. He was the expert. He was in charge. It was his boat, his way. And it was exactly that boat that Jesus decided to board one day out on the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus gets all settled on Peter's boat and he says, hey, let's head out in the deeper waters, catch us some fish. Peter, being the expert, he says, uh, sir, I'll do respect. Um, we've been fishing all night. They just aren't biting. Do you, do you hear that? That right there. Peter doesn't think Jesus can do anything for him. Peter thinks his concerns are gonna go unmet. You know, as hard as he tries to make ends meet, his nets just come up empty. I, I know that feeling. That scary, frustrating feeling of not getting what you want. But it seems like the more I make my life and my concerns about me, the more I come up empty. But Jesus keeps looking at Peter, and Peter says, okay, fine, if you say so. And then, boom, the nets hit the water. The boat lurches to one side. Peter can barely pull the nets in. They're so full of fish. But he finally does, and he dumps his catch on the bottom of the boat. He casts his nets out again. Boom, another enormous catch. The Bible says that the boat begins to sink from the weight of all these fish. And it's here. In a pile of smelly, slimy fish that Peter falls on his knees. And he says, oh, depart from me, O oh Lord, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus, he says something crazy. He says, hey, don't be afraid. Because from now on, I'll make you a fisher of men. So what concerns you? Have you been so focused on making the catch? So focused on what you need to get done, need to accomplish? Are you trying to be good at what you do? Responsible, successful? Yeah, so was Peter. Then he gets all that he wants in life, a good catch. And when he gets it, he realizes it pales in comparison to the man standing in front of him. It's crazy. The Bible says they pull their boats up to shore and immediately Peter drops his nets and follows Jesus. Now, hold on a second. I've heard this story before, but I don't think I've ever really felt the weight of it. If a fisherman drops his nets, his livelihood is in danger. His family may get upset with him. He can't provide for himself anymore. He loses control what concerns him most. But that's just it. That's what Jesus does to us. He says, in order for us to walk like him, know him, become all that we were made to be, we first have to drop who we are and what we care about. We have to drop our nets 
and that's terrifying. However, Jesus says, I will also fulfill your concerns. He says, do you want to make a great catch? Well, I'll let you make a great catch for the kingdom. So what do you need to drop? Those concerns that absorb and consume your thoughts. Maybe if you drop those, Jesus will take you where you never expected. Because Jesus is calling you just like he called Peter, and you must make a decision to keep fretting and struggling with your own concerns or to drop them all and follow him. looking at the life of the Apostle Peter, who uh, was just a run-of-the-mill average Joe. No uh, special talents that we're aware of. And yet when Jesus got a hold of him and when Jesus began to use him, when Peter surrendered his life to him, he used him in extraordinary ways. And the, the fisherman Peter became a fisher of men who became the great Apostle Peter. And uh, so for the next uh, four weeks, we're going to challenge you to consider who you are, what your relationship with Jesus is really like, and how, surrender to him, you might be greatly used. This um, series is entitled Prayer, Care, Share. The films that you're watching are produced by Christ in Youth. If you're regular here, you know that we send our students to uh, summer conferences. The middle school is mixed. The senior high is move. And uh, those conferences have changed the lives of our students. And the overriding theme year to year from mix and move is calling young people to be kingdom workers. And that's what we're calling you to do. It's just coincidentally that my son Taylor is the director of MOVE, the narrator of these films. And um, Dad is obviously proud of him, but uh, we, uh, uh, we just felt like these films that all of our students saw two summers ago would be very effective in what we're, we're wanting to tell you in these few weeks. The uh, stage has been set and it will remain this way for the next four Sundays because it's a reminder that God is calling you as missionaries into your community. He called you out of a community and is now, is now working in you, discipling you to go back into your community uh, to pray for them to share, uh, to care for them and, and to share the love of Christ with them. As I walked into the auditorium today, this is the first time I saw it, and my first thought was, oh no, people are going to think we will do anything to raise money. Uh, <laughs> garage sale, a lemonade stand, that's, that's, not the, uh, that's not the purpose of that. This is the season of outreach, and we are trying to elicit as many volunteers as we can the next few months for big events in the life of our church. Bridge Fest, the community uh, event next month, or, or next week rather. In, in a few weeks, our trunk or treat, hundreds and hundreds of children come and are introduced to Bridge through trunk or treat. Later in the season, our candlelight service, uh, thousands attend that, and by the way, we have outgrown our ability to do it here. Uh, we are doing four candlelight programs here. It's going to be an expo this, uh, this Christmas season, our candlelight service. Another opportunity for you to help, for you to invite, and we're looking for a great uh, turnout from our community. Behind all of these outreach opportunities is our outreach committee and our full-time outreach minister, Stacy Burkholder. In just a moment, Stacy is going to come and share with you um, 
the thought behind prayer, care, share. I am so proud of him in the work that he's done and the, the work that he and his team do to engage us all in outreach ministry. If you're part of Stacy's outreach committee or if uh, Stacy uses you in some kind of outreach ministry, if you have been involved in recent weeks in some kind of outreach operation, would you please stand? All right, and would you remain standing? And uh, we owe such a great, uh, a great debt of gratitude to Stacy, um, my other boy that I'm proud of. He's going to come today for these and for Stacy as he comes. Would you show them a great round of applause? Thank you, Todd. Thank you for that kind, kind introduction. Uh, it is just an exciting season that we're moving to here at Bridge as we will have the opportunity to uh, connect with the lives of hundreds and hundreds of people in these next few months through the opportunities that Todd mentioned. As we move into that season, there really is a sense, especially in our outreach team, that we are building momentum, that we are building uh, preparedness in the lives and the hearts of people here at Bridge to accept, to love on those people as they arrive, to find those people in the community that you know that would benefit from having a relationship with Jesus, that would benefit from having a relationship with this loving body. And so it is with that in mind that we kind of march into this new series called Prayer Care Share. It is the heartbeat of our outreach ministry. It is the so much of of what we're all about and a part of. I wanted to build just a little bit more on this idea that Peter was so normal. So as we move into something like this, a lot of times we check ourselves off of the list of eligibility because of what we know about ourselves. The person that we know we are outside of these doors, inside of our own homes and communities. And I just want to reassure you that I don't know how you view the pastoral staff here, the ministry team here at Bridge, but I've got to tell you, I, I've spent a lot of time with them, and I know me well, and we're just about as common folk, common sinner as there is on the planet. And so as you listen to this, I want you to remember again that Peter is a lot like us, is a lot like you. And if God can use him in that amazing way, then what can he do with the life of a person that is wholly given over to him despite all of their flaws? I could illustrate this well. I, uh, my wife's birthday was last week. And uh, one of my favorite gifts to give her is to take her out for dinner. And selfishly, part of that is, is because I get part of the gift. <laughs> Right? It's like, I want to take you out for a nice dinner. Right? <laughs> she agreed, of course. It is something we love to do. And so we went out. Uh, she, she picked Olive Garden, which I love. You know? So I am psyched for her birthday. Like, I just can't wait. We're going to... So I work and we go out. And as we're getting ready to get in the car, uh, she, she lets me know, Honey, you know, I, I think I'd also like to go to Hobby Lobby. <laughs> what? <laughs> that wasn't part of the plan. <laughs> now that's what I was saying on the inside. On the outside, oh honey, that'd be fine. We should just go. It'll be good. So my goal is, is that we go out to eat, and if we eat long enough, Hobby Lobby will close. <laughs> right? And if we just sit in long enough, Hobby Lobby, they'll turn the light. Oh honey, next time. Next time. But uh, before I could really formulate that idea and speak, she said, you know, no, I'm not super hungry. I think we should go there first. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so happy. And so we, we do. We load up and drive uh, to Hobby Lobby in Harrisonburg, because that's where Olive Garden is. Love that they've got one close by now. And, and so the only thing standing in between me and her birthday dinner is, uh, is this trip into Hobby Lobby. And so you want, and if you've ever been there, and I pray that you haven't, uh, <laughs> that, that it's just, it's, there's just so much stuff, right? It's all this houseware, homeware goods. And so usually she lets me sit in the truck, 
right? Usually, honey, I'll just stay in here and turn on a ball game, and she goes in and hours later comes back with like one thing. And so this time, it's her birthday. So I'm going in. Oh, hon, I'll go in and walk with you. And as soon as you go into those places, the will to live just starts leaking out. <laughs> I mean, there's, it's just overwhelming, all of the aisles. And, and I'm just, after about four aisles, I'm just kind of dragging one leg behind her. And, you know, oh, look at this, honey. Oh, that's wonderful. You should buy it. You should buy it. And then we could go. And then it's just hours of this. We're just turning. And, and I thought we had reached the end at one point, And I see the register up there. And then she, she I think she had just sang it. She was like, oh, we haven't seen this aisle yet. And it was like, <laughs> you know, just dragging. OK, one more. Uh, we finally found a basket. And then I suppose it was about, you know, oh, this is, you know, we'll buy this basket and we'll hang it on the wall. OK, great. Let's take. So we're walking out and we're almost to the register. Like I can smell the fettuccine. <laughs> and we're to the register and, I, and it hooks on something. And I notice that it's broken. So it's like, hon, I think this one's broken. And then the four words, or the, the words that just dread, dread into my heart was, oh, well, let's go back and we'll just look for something else. We'll get a replacement. I'm like, well, that's okay. You know, we'll find it. We'll f so we go meandering back and I'm just following the trail of my will to live through the store. You know, and we find the basket and buy it and go out to dinner. Listen, that is just a small glimpse into the heart that lives in this guy. Right? My mind often wanders into places it should not be. I often give up my prayer life, my time with Jesus for a baseball game. There are days when I should go out back and play with my son that I'd rather sit in a chair and take a nap. I often am not the man that Jesus wants me to be. And yet I believe that God is saying to you, as you sit here with all of your weaknesses and your rough edges and your failures, and he says, if I can use a man like Peter, who would deny me three times, who was impetuous and did things that I wish he hadn't done, if I can use him, if I can use Stacy Burkholder, then what could I not do with you? And so as we move into something as challenging as prayer, care, share, I hope that you will stay in the game, that you will seat yourself in that place of, okay, I may try that. I may do that with my life. And so I want you to turn down the voices in your head that say you're not good enough, you're not, you're not smart enough, you're not all of those things, and listen to what the heart of prayer, care, share is all about. You see, one of the great joys in life that I hope you've had an experience just to at least taste it is being a part of the process of drawing someone out of the hurting wreckage of their past. To see God literally begin to work and turn the lights on in their eyes and turn the spirit on in their heart as they soften and they begin to have hope and purpose rebuilt again in their life. To be used by God in that process is one of the great experiences of life. If you've ever allowed yourself to step into that circumstance, you also know that it can be one of the most challenging things that you've ever done. Stepping into the life of another human being can be so complicated and complex, but it is what we've been called to do. Now, I want you to realize that God uses people like us, like you, in this process. In 1 Corinthians, as Paul is writing, he says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And so as we recognize that we've been called, that we've been asked by Christ himself to enter into the lives of others, realize he uses people just like you and I. Because we have been called. One of the last things that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, one of the marching orders that he left, not just for his disciples, but for each one of us, were these simple words. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. See, God's plan for reaching the world with his message of forgiveness and love is you and I. 
We are the vessels, we are the mouthpiece often for God's miraculous change in people's lives. And so as we determine to step into the circle of someone else's life, it's important we recognize that they are both flesh and spirit. That they are not just the ordering of subatomic particles. They're not just flesh and blood, but there is a soul, a spirit that God has designed and placed in them. That they have this part of them that will live on into eternity. You see, God has designed inside each one of you this spiritual peace that is as unique as your facial features. It is unique as your fingerprints. And it is that thing that long after this body is dead and buried, but will live on into eternity. It's because of this realization that people are a soul, that people have this spiritual component to them, that we have to involve God in the process of bringing life change into their heart. We must involve him from the beginning. And the exercise of involving God involves prayer. Prayer will be the centerpiece. It will be the beginning and the end of reaching people in this spiritual zone of their life. Prayer gives us a direct line into the throne room of God. It is that piece of, of our human flesh that can reach right through the, the, the spiritual boundaries and into a place where we can begin to make change into this part of people's lives. You see, God alone gave the unique spirit, the unique soul to the person that you love and care about. Ezekiel writes about how God and, and his interaction with the soul of people in Ezekiel 36 when he writes, God will give you a new heart. He says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony and stubborn heart and give you a heart of flesh, a tender and responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. It is God's work that we are praying for. We cannot change a person's heart. We cannot alter their spirit. But God can. And that is the great place of prayer in the spiritual battle. You see, if you're going to really see impact in the lives of the people you love, a grandchild, a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, some co-worker, then we will have to employ the spiritual battle because it is a spiritual battle. I've expressed this verse many times this, this year through different sermons, but in Ephesians, there is a reality that we have to be aware of. As Paul writes to the Ephesian church, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, if we're going to see change in the people we care about and love, it will begin, it must begin with prayer. Now, while it's essential that we recognize that people have a soul, that they're a spiritual being, and that prayer must be used, it's also important to recognize that they have a body, that they're made of flesh, that we have five physical senses that God has given us to experience this amazing world, that we have a mind that is able to comprehend what those senses are experiencing. It's important that we care because caring is where love gets real. It is where when God is working on the inside and he's developing and nurturing someone's soul that we come alongside that process. And when we care and we love for someone, it resonates and those two processes begin to help someone to experience God in a real and tangible way. When we care for another person we are praying for, then it confirms and reaffirms on the outside what God is doing on the inside. We uh, see this correlation, and I love James when he teaches. When you read his, uh, his letter in the Bible, he just has a real straight shooter mentality. James, too, writes this about this correlation between dealing with the spiritual and the physical at the same time. 
when he writes, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. What about a faith? What about a spiritual life that uses love, uses caring, uses service to touch other people? I think we'll find, as we dig deeper into this series of Prayer Care Share, that when you take your prayer and you involve opportunities to care, that you will find a fruit. You will find an experience that goes well beyond anything you've ever experienced to this point. But what is the goal? What is the purpose of all of this praying and caring? Why do you add it to your already busy life, delivering meals, showing up at prayer meetings, writing cards of encouragement, why do you add all of these things to your already overwhelmed life? The goal is very simple. I believe the goal is simply Jesus. We are designed for eternity. The great Hebrew King Solomon reminds us that he, God, has planted eternity in the human heart. You see, we're destined for eternity. And we will spend it in one of two places, either heaven or or hell. And if we really believe, if we really accept that Jesus, the Son of God, was sent down to earth and is the only gift powerful enough that through his blood shed, through his body broken, that we could be healed and cleansed of our sin, if we really believe that that's true, then there is a whole world of people that need to hear that message. In the weeks ahead, I hope you will begin to understand the need of not only praying for our friends in need, not only caring for the tangible things that you see in their life, but that you are prepared, that you are willing to share the gospel. That great message of hope and peace that transformed my life that same story, that same simple message of Christ's death, burial, resurrection, the faith in him that you experienced, that we would, as God opens that door, step through it in faith and in trembling, and that we would share the gospel, that we would not stop short at just praying and caring for people's needs, but that there is a means to an end, and that end is Jesus himself. So in the weeks ahead, we're going to speak to this simple call. We're going to dig deep into what it means to do these things. You see, Prayer Care Share, again, is the heartbeat of our outreach ministry. It is the thing that I believe simply directs our steps in life, not just in this building. I believe it will define our ability to help the great scope of need that we see in our community and around the world. The thing that defines it all is Jesus' willingness to walk up a hill and with all of the power in the universe living in his body, laid himself down, allowed him to be nailed one nail at a time to a tree for a sinner like you and I. It is that great gospel message that we celebrate every Sunday here when these trays are passed. In them, you'll see the bread that represents Jesus' body broken so that we could have hope. You'll see little cups of juice that re represent his blood shed so that I could be cleansed white as snow. And so this morning as we partake again, I pray that this meal would never grow old, but it would refresh anew every day the thankfulness and the joy that we experience because of him. Let's pray. Father, would you help us to just fall in love with you again so that your love exudes from us to the point that we can't help but share it with others. That like a great restaurant, Father, that we can't wait to tell friends about, that we would love you so much. And through that, that we would just look forward to expressing our love for you to other people. 
Father, thank you for the gift of your life. In Jesus' name, amen.